crazy. Hey, but that's how it goes. I need to go to a happier place. I feel romantic. Get hot, Pussy. Just go to bed, darling. <laughs> All right, change the subject. All right, hi. This is the uh, Osborne's podcast. Um, hi, I'm Jack. Hi, I'm Sharon. Good hi. morning. Hi, I'm Kelly. And why don't you introduce our special guest today, Jackie? We are joined by the very, very special Margaret Cho. Yay! Yay. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, this is very exciting. Here. Thank you. Lots of fun. And uh, who's this guest you have This with is you? Lucia Katerina Lawler Cho. Whoa. Oh, she's so gorgeous. And she put on her leather vest because she knew she was coming here. She wanted to represent the the first family of rock. Oh, <laughs> with her leather no. vest. She's got barbed wire on the back. <laughs> so cool. So she's very excited to be here. <laughs> she's uh she's sporting. Yes. And it's a good oh, look. It makes me miss Martini. Martini. Why don't, why don't you share with Margaret the story of Martin? Which story? How he would uh how he liked to poop. Oh, he was amazing. So <laughs> It was like the coolest thing you've ever seen because you'd be walking around the house and then all of a sudden you'd look at the wall and be like, is that a piece of shit stuck to the wall? <gasps> wow. He would get on his front two <laughs> paws, <laughs> stick his ass up in the air and like almost like a handstand, walk backwards mm. and push his little butthole against the wall and like s smack a little turd. Oh, it looked wow. like a Hershey kiss on the wall. Wow. And it would, always, it would be like six, seven inches up from the floor. And because at first I was like, it couldn't be Martin. He's too little. But because he was doing a hand, like a handstand to do it, mm. it um, made it up the wall a little higher. And it was just, I think it was the funniest thing ever. It never made me mad because it was just so funny. Do you know who else craps like that? Gingy. No, Elvis. Mm. Does he? That's another one of our dogs. Oh, so he's Wait, that's does a family he go, trait. Yeah. He runs in the yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, does he go on handstand or do yes. you just push it against the... No, he does. He d half. That's crazy. Hmm. Anyway, moving right along. It's a rocket launch. launch. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a rocket like a, launch, it's, for sure. It's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I always, have, I am amazed by comedians. Like, mm -hmm. I, It's one of those things where, you know, I, I listen to a ton of podcasts and I watch a lot of comedy and I'm just like... It's one of those things where, you know, when you see someone act, you're like, okay, I get how an actor can act. When you see someone write music, play music, I'm like, okay, I understand that. I just don't, like the, the mindset of comedians, I think is something that's a very, it, it's very unique. And I just, I, I just, I, I try and analyze it probably mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's a, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I always want to know, well, how do, how do you, feel confident enough to go okay i'm going to say this what this idea that i had <laughs> i'm now going to go in front of a bunch of people i'm going to say it in hopes that a it's funny b that it's making a point yeah well it's like you just never know it's really hard to know it's terrifying it's really terrifying but it's also like um i'm also curious about it like maybe oh maybe this is actually interesting maybe this is something that might be fun to talk about maybe this perspective is needed and um but yeah comedians really mystify me the way that their minds work and some things I just can't imagine like but th that's the, this is the nature of the art form it's such a bizarre one and it's one that's so like it's hard to even know like how do people get there there's no school really but what I really love about the the community of comedians and comedy in itself is that it it's it's a world where everybody is trying to lift everyone else up mm -hmm. it's not it they don't shit on each other like the rest of Hollywood right. and it, it's a craft that they practice and learn and constantly wanting to show new material constantly mm -hmm. evolving constantly changing constantly keeping up with the times and just the because of that and spending so much time with Joan Rivers for a really long time I thought maybe that's what I wanted to do was go into comedy mm, yeah yeah but then I realized I'm not that funny so it's not, you are funny. No, it's not. But you. But it, I thought that maybe that was something that I would want to do. It's mm -hmm. it's it's amazing though to see how it's evolved over time. Because mm -hmm. before it used to be, oh, uh, there's an Irishman, a Jew, and a gay guy in a boat, <laughs> and the. You, do you know what I'm saying? They were mm -hmm. kind of made up jokes, mm -hmm. and now they are about. 
yourself, the way mm -hmm. you look at the world, about yes. what's happening to you and in the world. So it's changed from silly one-liners, mm -hmm. you know, take my wife, please, all of that, and into very personal view on everything. Right. Do you think that many um, comedians are depressants? Yes. Yeah. It, it comes with it, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Depressed and um, imposter syndrome and insecure and um, all sorts of undiagnosed and diagnosed mental illness. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. Yes. I can't imagine what it would be like to constantly be trying to make everyone laugh. And then when I wasn't on, I would just want everybody to leave me alone. So when you're not working and in the mindset of being a comedian and somebody walked up to you and was like, oh, be funny. Wouldn't you just want to be like, fuck off? <laughs> well, I just don't even know how to respond to it because I'm like, I'm not sure even how, you know, yeah. like I don't know how to access that part of myself. It's just like when I can work is when I'm just definitely focused on it. But I'm very awkward in social settings, I think. So I need these like crutches to do that in a sense. So it's that's why I was such a drinker for so long and did so many drugs is because I was so fearful of social interaction. Mm -hmm. Did you did you used to? Uh, do your comedy while you were fucked up or was it yeah but it was never um, I never really had to get high to do a show that and that that's sort of the area that in my life I needed to protect because mm. I knew that if I fucked that up that I wouldn't be able to keep doing drugs so I have to make sure that I can it, at least do comedy oh that's an interesting like, take on it yeah. but it's like Ozzy used to be that way his his treat to himself was after a show he'd do drugs mm -hmm. and get out of it mm -hmm. so that was his treat for doing a good show yeah yeah me too I needed that to, to do the show like that was like I have to keep this part of myself whole in order to fall apart yeah. elsewhere mm. can we talk about sobriety stuff yeah. or is that, yeah. is that is that on the okay yeah yeah uh, how, how long have you been sober now uh this time around uh, seven years, right on, which Woo! is great. But I've been, I've I've been around since 1996. So, uh, but hopefully this time around it will stick. I think so. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on it this time. So I didn't really get it the last time around, the last times around. But it's like also a constantly evolving project. You know, your mental health and your your well being. It's it's like a it's an ongoing living work of art that you have to keep applying yourself to. Absolutely, we know all about that in this house. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, uh, and how have you found, you know, I mean, you're, you're at clubs uh, an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Was that was that ever a problem for you? No, no, because it's kind of like, um, you know, when you're at clubs or shows, the substances and alcohol and all that, that's really for the audience. Yeah. You know, like the, 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 the performers really rarely imbibe. If they do, you don't see them around for very long. Yeah. You know, so um, it's just like, Especially also if you're in your like later part, you know, your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know how to do drugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know how to do it properly. You're not going to do it at work in general, I think. So it's a very, um, it, the, going to clubs, doing this, because I never did like drugs in, in that setting. I would, I would be more apt to just do it on my own. Mm. I was like that. Yeah. And I also didn't want to share my drugs. No, why? So I, I it was very much like... I would walk into another room and do what I had to do, and then meet up with everyone else. Right, right. Yeah, you you're not a you're not a social uh, user. No. Kelly's like. Yeah. <laughs> then my drugs. <laughs> Has not anyone yours? seen Kelly lately? It's been like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but I would do it in order to be social. Yeah. So that, like, you know, my preference was to not do it around anybody. But if I had to be social, then I would do it just to do that. To give you confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. make that little voice tell it, that tells you you're not good enough to be there. Shut up for five minutes. Yes, or that you're too good to be here. Shut up for the, you know, like See, oh, I my, never had my, that. My, yeah, I'm like I'm. I can't believe I'm. This is a beneath me. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I love it. Here's I a question. Love that. <laughs> I have. Have you ever snapped? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, totally snapped. But also, it's more internal so i'm not really sure i've like snapped at a couple because like, i would get that opiates rage mm. you oh, know it's the worst when you get like but opiates, it makes you itchy and bitchy itchy and bitchy but then you combine that with some zanny 
like entitlement. <laughs> you get the you get all barred up, and then you're like super entitled and super angry, and then it's just a recipe for disaster. And there's no cars available. I'm too good for you. <laughs> yeah, at the, at Avis. <laughs> I'm not even at Enterprise. I'm at Avis. <laughs> See, so. I, my my trouble is I never feel good enough. Mm. Mm. I never feel like I've worked hard enough or I belong or that I deserve anything. Even if I've worked really, really hard for it, I'll find some justification to tell myself that you should have worked harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an awful like race uh, or competition you play with yourself. And getting out of that mentality was really difficult for it's me. It's hard. It's hard because it's like it's almost um, – it's just that – it, it's the same thing of, of being entitled, super entitled and super above it or think that you're too good for it too because they're both si two sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. which is just self-obsessed fear. Yeah. So we're both not in the moment and not thinking of others because we're thinking about ourselves in, the, in there as opposed to what's happening. When I think about how much I used to think about myself versus before I got sober versus now, is crazy. I don't think about myself as I used to sit there thinking about myself all day long. How could these people do this to me? And why does this happen to me? And how do I deserve this? And being a constant victim. And that train of thinking has completely done a 180. It's flipped on itself. And mm. I'm way more I'm like, if I start thinking in that way, I train myself to be like, hold on a minute. This is old Kelly thinking. Mm -hmm. Like, what is your part in it? Yeah, yeah. Do you never think, aren't I blessed, aren't I lucky to be here? Yes. Oh, every day. Every day. Yeah. Every day. That's every actually day. something Joan Rivers taught me. Mm. And she used to say before every show was how lucky we are to have the jobs that we have and work with people that we all, like, I loved and still love Joan like she was family. Mm -hmm. Like having that, her as a mentor was incredible yeah. and I never thought I would ha be able to have a relationship with anyone but my mum with like that before because I, I never talked to anybody but my mum like that and when Joan came into my life and I it, and ha having her root for you made you feel so special yeah because she was so selective yeah about who she would talk with and really be herself with so, you know, you're really lucky. It's like really, I mean, she really cared for you. And she also really admired your vision and your style and your humor. So, and that's a really big vote of confidence because she was just such a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> she could be so She was such hardcore. a bitch. So, you know, if she liked you, that you were doing something good, you know? <laughs> She's just the best. The best. Fabulous. I miss her. Yeah. I miss her so much. I miss her so much. I have all these things in my house that are like notes from her mm -hmm. and, and little, like the, my favorite one is this note she taped to my forehead while I was asleep on a plane. <laughs> And I woke up and it was like, Kelly, darling, we have to stop meeting like this. I'm in 3H. And I, I, like, I, I, when I woke up, I thought, oh, my God, I'm dead. Because I, my eyes were open, but I couldn't see anything. And it was because she sellotaped it right to oh my, my forehead. God. <laughs> and then I pulled it off, read it, and Aww. turned around and she was there. And I still have the note and just little bits of fun that we used to have yeah. on set and yeah. that I just can't ever part with because mm -hmm. it reminds me of her so and Melissa. Yes. Because so me, me and Melissa used to fight like sisters. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That would be some fights. I can imagine. Yeah. We did. But we, the thing is that like we... You guys got we, over it quick. No, we loved each yeah. other. That's why. You only have that kind of passion and can argue in that way with people that you genuinely care about because mm -hmm. if you don't care about them, you can't be bothered. Right. And it just, it was just great. Hey everyone, it's Kelly Osborne and the Osborne's podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's the end of the year season and although I love the holidays, I'd be lying if I said I didn't struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot for people, whether it's the reminder of loved ones who are no longer with us or the unrealistic expectations of the holiday season altogether. It's natural to feel anxiety. But adding something new and positive can help to counteract some of those feelings. And that's where therapy comes in. Therapy has really helped me navigate the season, especially with a newborn. I'm learning how to give 
to others and still give to myself at the same time and feeling good about it. If you're thinking of starting therapy, you should try BetterHelp. It's entirely online and even in the bustle of the holiday season, you can suit it to your own schedule. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Osborns today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Osborns. We're going to, we're going to dive into a bit of true crime. Are you a true crime fan? Yes. Okay. Do you like, did you like binge on all the murder porn and all that? Yes. Um. I am from like the 90s of like Faces of Death. Oh, yeah. Like all of that crazy, ridiculous horror stuff. Yeah. Like I think it's so interesting. Do you still do you still go down the, the, the rabbit hole of weirdness on the internet? Yes. But you know where the, you could find a lot of that stuff is on Tubi, which is the very best streaming service because it's free. Mm-hmm. It has all of the crazy trash and also the crazy like um, kind of very B, C, D horror films and gore and all that stuff. It's really nuts. But I'm super interested in true crime. And I I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. And I read a book on the cases that – one of the cases I read a book on and then one of the other cases I watched a series on. And there's a lot there. Yeah. All right, so we've we've still like Kelly. You want to go through the 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 true crime uh, just topics of discussion for us today? Okay, so we have three topics. The first one is Lorena Bobbitt. Everyone's got something to say about that. I know that. Okay, so let's let's dive into Lorena Bobbitt. What? All right, mom, we'll let you because this is one of your favorites. Um, do you wanna do you wanna uh, educate the the good listeners of uh, the Osborns podcast? Oh, on... well, the thing is, I don't know all the details that led up to it. Was he cheating? Yeah, he was like a. I think he was like a, a kind of an abusive problem home yeah. like very uh he was a really um abusive uh coercive control kind of thing like it was just a lot of a lot of drinking a lot of cheating um and she was very young when they got together and um she kind of put all of her hopes and dreams of also emigrating from ecuador onto this marriage mm-hmm. and um so yeah very difficult yeah it's um with situations like that and you put your whole life in someone's hands and then that person puts you down all the time keeps mm-hmm. putting you down and you know you feel like you're choking you've got no life and you're cornered um i i just it's better than killing someone but wait what happened she cut his willy off Okay. And then what happened? <laughs> she threw it out the car window. <laughs> <laughs> and then As what, one does. And, and then, then what, what happened, happened, Mom? Then they found the willy and they sewed it back on. And then what did he do? He went into porn. And the <laughs> thing is... Can we please talk about the name of his porn movie? John Wayne Bobbitt, Uncut. Mm. Oh. No, wasn't it called Franken Penis? There was, was two it? movies. Yeah. There's two? Yeah, I think there was two movies. Wow. There's Frank and Penis, which I think is <laughs> Margaret, really are you funny. Se- are you secretly a John Wayne Bobbitt historian? <laughs> I know way too much. So uh, recently I was told that he was delivering pizza in upstate New York <gasps> where I was doing shows. And no. I was really like, did you oh order, God, a I should order a pizza? Um, I would have ordered a pizza. Yeah, with lots of pepperoni. But it's like a very like, um, he's just... I think became like a folk hero after this happened because I think he really represented a lot of men's fear in the 90s. Men in the 90s were really, I think, afraid of women's emerging power. And so here was a way that you could maybe uh, lift up some victim of it without necessarily being hurt yourself. So he was kind of like on Howard Stern a lot. He was um, (laughs) at wrestling matches. You know, he was like kind of... pulled up by male society saying look he's you know we got to help this guy would you say he was pulled up by his scrotum (laughs) like we can never let this happen again yes or that this is like this is the guy that we need to you know make him he's one of us yeah make him stand up again wait didn't you have didn't you get death threats after a similar 
I did, yeah. There was a there was another what was it? Another she, woman a lady put a guy's willy down the disposal unit after mm. she cut it off. Mm. And I was just trying to be funny. I was just saying, Oh, you know, good for her and you know, well done sort of thing. Mm. As a, it just you just throw it out to be glib, that's yeah. all. And then this men's group. Um, started threatening me and saying I should be shot in the head oh, and horrible. Yeah, all was... of this. And so I, they had... Do they have <laughs> men's groups like that? Yeah, there's yeah. like men's advocacy groups yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Mom, can I ask a question? Yeah. Have you ever wanted to cut dad's dick off? Oh, boy. Oh, Ooh. Lord. No, no. I never thought I'm going to get you back by um, cutting your willy off. No. But I've See, done that's other things, I would but never, not that. I would never... Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, I would... That wouldn't be my first thought. No, mm. mine neither. I just wouldn't. It just doesn't. It would be. It would be more like I'm going to put like near in your shampoo. So when you wash your hair, you go bold. Yeah. Or something in that way. Why don't you tell everybody some of the things that you have done, Mum? Because they're pretty magical. Oh. <laughs> um. Shit is weed. Shit in his weed, yeah. Oh, we wow. did. Do you remember oh, yeah. he no. chased us around the, the hotel? hotel. No, okay, oh, God. Mum came to me and, uh, no, I found it. I came to mum, showed it to her, and then she's like, Kelly, do you need to go to the toilet? And I said, no, I'm not doing this again for you. I'm an, I'm too old now. I'm not going to shit in dad's drugs. And so she... <laughs> this is so bad. So she, um, <laughs> she shit in it, and it was in a tiny Ziploc bag, like a... Uh, um, like, like not a little, even a sandwich one. It was like, like the little like eighth, you the know, snack, the bag you get the yeah. eighth in. Oh, yeah. And um, she shit in it, zipped it back up again and put it back. And then when he found out, he went nuts and chased us down the hallway. And like... The, the weirdest thing, though, about it is like his react. He went so fucking nuts and like nearly like knocked a door off a hinge at this hotel we were in. <laughs> and we were in Hawaii, as one does, at with a lovely we, holiday we, hotel. We were at the Four Seasons in Hawaii. It was 1995, maybe? Yeah, about and that. it's the hotel that they did White Lotus in. Oh, so oh, yeah, it's a really nice hotel. Yeah. Yes, and but the funny thing was, as an adult, I'm like, it wasn't like it was like ten pounds of like the most expensive weed yeah. ever. Yeah, like the good shit. It, it was, was yeah. dirt weed. It had seeds in it. It was like not <laughs> even a. It was like it literally the shittiest weed, and he yeah. went fucking nuts. Like we he, all ran and yeah. we had friends with us and we were all running down we, the hallway. Well, we did because he got into one room and then we ran into another one and shut the connecting door. Mm -hmm. And that's the door he almost broke off the hinge. Yeah. And while he was trying to break into that room, we were running down the hallway and he just... These, <laughs> everyone's going to be like, oh my God, the family trauma. It was actually kind of funny. It, it was, was very funny. funny. Yeah. Did he did he throw it away? He threw it away. But I've I've done I've done shit like that to him before. He wouldn't stop drinking one time and he was drinking uh brandy and I just got the bottle and wrapped it round my ass and then he oh took a swig and then he went back again and then he was like <laughs> This is just horrible. And then he looked at me. <laughs> I hate he this. looked at me. I hate this. And he goes, You didn't and I go, I did. <laughs> and it's like, ah. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, cutting willies off, no. I yeah. never... I mean, listen, at the end of the day, you're still fucking violently mutilating someone. <laughs> it's fucked. Yeah, I don't know. I get so... Yeah, the act of that is freaky. Uh, in the Lorena miniseries, or it's a, this series by uh, Jordan Peele on, on Amazon Prime, they actually show the penis. No. So they show... it. He he uh, had the, the shaft and the head were separated. So they showed the, Whoa, just the so head. so she like hacked it. Yeah, so she just like lopped off the, the mushroom head. Oh, just like a little pinch and snip? Yeah, and then the rest of it was intact, but it was like separated. <sighs> so they showed it right before surgery. I wasn't ready for it. Like I was so, it was so brutal. Like I was really shocked. And That's a dickhead. Yeah, I, I mean, you just don't, you never see it. You no, never see it separated. To me, it's like the same thing as if a guy's got a fetish of, Cutting off women's oh, yeah. breasts. Yeah. I mean, you just oh. don't. That's Ed it's, Gein. It's too much. Yes, that's Ed it's, Gein. Yeah. At least Ed Gein did it. Waited. At least he waited till they were dead. Yeah, it's oh. true. Yeah, and, it was and, respectful. And his shoe boxes of vulvas. He was respectful though. He did waited till he just dug them up out of oh. the ground. Yeah. 
He's you, not as no, I he's, just couldn't. It's weird. It is, I, but I just don't. I listen. Hey, I I don't know. Another but. fun fact about this that makes me laugh a lot is that when they found the dismembered Willie, what they did with it is they because it was right next to a Seven Eleven on a piece a patch of grass. They got a hot dog box <laughs> and took it to the hospital from Seven Eleven from Seven Eleven in a Seven Eleven hot dog box. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine the cop that was like? I found the dick. And I bet they went, this bitch. No, they wouldn't. They were scared. Yeah. They wouldn't touch it. They were so afraid. And it was almost like she became a kind of like a fearsome goddess. <laughs> like like this thing of like, oh, nobody did, wanted to touch it because they were like so afraid of this happening to She's them. like Shiva. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So terrifying. <laughs> wow. And then, but like, well, yeah, he did Franken penis because it wasn't, didn't he end up doing like weird penis fetish porn like get, yeah yeah after well it was just like that what did it look what does it look like now that it's been a sewn back franken on? dick i think does it have a, a scar or there's a scar there's a scar where bolts. it was severed and then it was like um so she sliced it down the middle yeah or not not like uh like look at okay if it's your thumb like yeah. she took off like right below the nail like the head yeah, of she it. just like beheaded it. Yeah, basically. Yes. She must have had to hold it like that, though. Yeah, she it. she grabbed the the tip. Was he sleeping? Yes, he was out, passed out, drunk, right? Yeah, he because was in a blackout. Drunk. That's the only way that I feel like you'd be she able to get your got away yeah. with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you? Oh man, just waking up like that. I don't know. And um, so he there was a roommate there, and he asked him for help, and the roommate didn't understand the urgency, so the roommate got up brushed his teeth, and then came and helped John. Whoa. So it was like they were so slow. Cleanliness and, yeah. is close to godliness. <laughs> just, it's so weird. <laughs> Shower it. And... Yeah, it's so weird. But they got him to, uh, it's a miracle that they got the, the appendage back. They got it sewn back on. It's, it's really... But she never served any time for doing she, it. Well, she went to, um, she was acquitted, but then she still had to spend time in an institution. Oh. So she did go uh she thought she was going to be free but in in the the, the so she was not guilty of um mutilation but she was um put forth for mm -hmm. I guess I guess assessment. I wonder how her dating life was since. I know I don't know. I don't like what do you put on your like Raya profile, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Love knives and penises. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, don't believe everything you've heard. Oh, um, who knows? Well, yeah. But um, she was very traumatized. I mean, obviously, she she must have been in order to take on something like that. I wonder if uh, any woman's bitten a man's head of his dick off. I mean, I've definitely seen horror movies where that happens. You have? Yeah. Oh. I watched There's even recently. a horror movie where a vagina has teeth. Yes, it's teeth. teeth. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret's like, mm, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. nice. <laughs> All right. All right. Should we move on to the next topic? Yeah. Go on. Okay. So, Lori, <laughs> let me get the name right. Lori Vallow, the doomsday mom. This is Do you know like, anything about this one, mom? Because the, the trial's going on as we speak. You would have seen it because I know you're a news junkie. This, this is the one. The in... This woman is insane. So crazy. Yeah. This is so horrible. Oh, it, God. It's so. Okay. I felt strongly about people hurting children before I had children. Mm -hmm. And now that I have a kid, even reading about what happened in this court case. It's hard. It, yeah. It's it's yeah. really difficult because this woman believed that her children had the devil in them. Yeah. And then she killed them, buried them in her garden and went on vacation. Yeah. And people were literally like following her with cameras saying, Where's where, the kids? where are your children? Yeah. And she's just like, I don't know. Yeah. And she, did she like burn them on like the the fire pit in her backyard? Well, the um, it was her new husband who uh, burned them. her brother actually. So they so it was a cult that they were following. Um, Chad Daybell, and Lori uh, Lori's husband was killed. Um, uh, Chad's wife was killed, and then the two kids were killed. Ball by. Lori's brother, who also mysteriously died some time after he committed the murders. And um, Chad buried the two kids in the pet cemetery on his own property. Uh, so they believe that there was this cult that was operating in the end times and getting ready for doomsday. And that the kids were already dead and they were 
being reanimated by zombies. Oh. So that they weren't killing the actual children. They weren't killing their actual spouses. They were killing these zombies. Re- reanimated zombies. That um, it was this whole cult thing behind it, which is so nuts. It's so bizarre. But um, that's kind of what happened. But this happened a long time ago, and it's only just coming to trial now. Yeah, because she was, I think, A, because of COVID, and then B, because they couldn't find the bodies. They couldn't find the bodies. And once they found the bodies, they were like, okay. Yeah, that chick just. So they but didn't. They find... She's not been waiting in prison. Yes, yes she has. Oh, she has. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, okay. they extradited her from uh, from Hawaii. Yeah, but I'm, they were on the run for a while. Am I also correct in thinking that when you see her in any of the court cases or any of the footage, it's almost like the lights are on but no one's home. Mm-hmm. Like it's a ve- There's a. She's um, transcended, Kelly. It, no, it's just, it's really weird. Like, there's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no hurt, but, there's no. no... But that's the amazing thing about, like, people who become, like, zealots in faith. Mm-hmm. They, 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 be, they, they're so at ease with, like, these atrocious acts because they feel that they're doing God's work that there's no guilt because they're like, no, I, I'm, this is, I'm doing this to appease god and uh, this is how i go on to the next plane of existence with you know with my planet yes it's it's wild i mean think about all the atrocious things that have happened in the name of of you know religion faith you know belief yeah. it's it's kind of it's it's more often than not it's awful though because it's just like these kids who really they she you know in the past had looked been looked on as a very good mother you know, and then um, her one daughter, the 16-year-old, Tylee, was very close to her mother. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then the little boy who had um, some learning difficulties, he was just differently abled. He had autism. Yeah. So it was like a very challenging way to be a mother, and she was supposedly, supposedly very good with him. So it's a very tragic thing to turn that. But in her sick mind, she thought she was caring for her kids by killing them. But, ha- but did they know how, these, how the kids were killed? They have a, a sort of an idea of um, that they were probably overpowered by uh, the brother. So, that would have been their uncle. Yeah, their uncle, which I think is one of the reasons why she it took a long time for her to go up for murder because she didn't actually physically commit the murders mm-hmm. but planned them. Oh. So she wasn't actually there dealing with the bodies or doing anything like that. But the old Charles kill, Manson. But yeah. didn't she kill the um, the... Ex-husband's wife? No, he, uh, he, 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 the ex-husband, no, the ex-husband, oh, no, the ex, the new husband, Chad Daybell, he killed his wife. Okay. With uh, combinations of drugs, like we, sleeping. We need like a Game of Thrones yeah. family tree for this. How Super complicated. These, how did these nutters find each other? It's amazing the how internet. they find each other. Well, through a other. podcast, because <laughs> Chad Daybell had a podcast where he was oh. talking all about his doomsday beliefs. Oh. And so they were podcasting, and then Lori was also a fan of his book. So it was all Chad Daybell who was sort of like the... Um, making all of these theories about the end times and what was happening. You know what's going to be nuts is that one day, right, there will be one whack job out there that's going to be like, the end's coming, the end's coming, and then they're fucking right. Yeah. <laughs> there will be, like, in, whether yeah. it's in 100 years or 10,000 years, there'll be that one quack who's like, <sighs> there's going to be a rock that falls out of the sky and kills us, yes. and it happens. Yes. Somebody's going to know. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. Right? Hopefully. Do you mm-hmm. join? Do you do we join that doomsday cult at that point? I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't like a doomsday cult. It's so, it's just like, I don't want it. I, I don't. I don't know. There's I, no future in it. I, <laughs> exactly. No, none. Oh, and the, the craziest thing is that have you heard the phone conversations between the eldest son and the mom? Oh, the mm. way she, where he's like, you have what? You just admit what you did. Where are they? Tell me where and they she's are. She's like, oh, I don't know. Like, she's just lofty about it. Mm-hmm. So weird. It's so weird. It's and so he wasn't. Um, no, the oldest son was like he was. I think he was. Uh, he was already moved out. Kind yeah, of. he was okay. like in his late twenties or early. 30s. He wasn't a zombie. No, he wasn't a zombie. He was just very far removed mm-hmm. from all of this. So it was just. Uh, yeah, it's just really a hor- horrible story. Everything about it. Mm. Yeah, she's just brainwashed. Yeah, you know that just that um, completely unending belief in this man and his wild theories about the world ending Mm. so that's kind of it's also her need to feel like special like chosen 
and all this stuff. It's very strange. I don't know. I think there's plenty of other ways you can feel special and chosen, Yeah, you don't right? have to. <laughs> like, I don't know, enter a beauty pageant or something. Well, she <laughs> is using Jolly Rancher for makeup when she goes to court. Oh, there you go. So she uh, has like implemented. How do you know that? I read a book about the oh. case before I came here. Come on, <laughs> Jolly Rancher. So she uh, uses Jolly Rancher, and I think she uses the blue M&M for eyeshadow. Get out of here. Yeah. So Orange is the New Black didn't lie. No, they do all that. <laughs> I wow. saw this really interesting TikTok on how you make uh, prison makeup. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was it's really cool how they do it and what they use to get different pigments and colors. And It's funny that our algorithms, my, my algorithms is this is how you make um, ice cream in prison and this is how you make toilet bowl hooch in prison. So, mm. you know, we're clearly looking yeah. at like the adjacent things. things. What is toilet bowl hooch? <laughs> like, at, like, they you, make it in the toilet, mum. It's alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Put a plastic bag in it. Like your toilet is like your stove in prison. Oh. Yeah. Gluck. Listen, you got to make do when mm -hmm. you're in the slammer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's oh. move on to our third and final nutcase. Richens. <laughs> Miss Richens. Um, she killed her husband and then wrote a book on dealing with grief for her children. No, I think she, she wrote the book first and then killed her husband. Oh, so she was ready. Yeah, she, she had, she had, I believe that's what it was, right? Yeah, because she, um, I didn't realize it was in that order. Yeah. And then this is the one, have you heard that this is the one that overdosed her husband on, on fentanyl? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So Which is so like evil. It, it's so evil because it's such a way that so many people die like that. Yeah. And it's just, of course, nobody's going to question any further. It's such a tragedy that nobody's going to question any further after it happens. Because you could just be like, oh, I bought bad pills. Or... Yeah, and you go, oh, well, see, that's how it goes. And, and it's then... happening to so many people. So many people. That you can just lump them into another person who got a batch of bad shit. Right. Where it's like, actually, he was murdered. And This is straight out of, like, Murder, She Wrote. Mm -hmm. or yeah. Or, like, something like that. It's straight out of a procedural TV show. Can you imagine a lady with a little hat and a handbag coming <laughs> in to solve it? Yeah. It's very, very, like, Miss Marple, yeah. Agatha Christie murders, because it's just, it's, like, so just the evil of somebody doing that, you know? Horrible. But, but how do you look at your children? How do you honestly look at well, your children? Well, she needed that. She wanted like life. In, it was like a, a life insurance policy. So mm -hmm. she clearly looked at her children with like dollar signs being like, well, we just cashed in. We're going to, you know, we're going to Disney World. Yeah. And maybe it's that idea of what they don't know can't hurt them, really. Yeah. And sh she's got the book ready. So they're fine. <sighs> it's incredible. There's no hate like marital hate. You know, marital hate is just something that is just so deep and vengeful. Yeah. So, you know, I can see something like that happening. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good point. Like you there's very few I, I, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a it's a unique feeling. It's a unique feeling when you've really been in love with somebody, you can hate them so much. That... That's the only kind of hate that I think is real. Yeah. When you love them, yeah. You have to love somebody at some point in order to hate them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just severe dislike. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm trying to think if I, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else that would drive that kind of emotion. Mm -hmm. it's... So it's betrayal, but it's also like you were wrong about them and, or, or they've changed or uh, you get to see a side of them that you didn't realize was always there and, you know, so disappointed. And mm. there's a lot of things that come up together. Uh, yeah. The, the trust thing, I think. And believing somebody of what they're telling you and then you realize they were just, you know, taking the piss out of you for yeah. years and then you just go like, then you then you get resentful of time that you've wasted mm -hmm. and time that you've invested right. Right. in that person Yeah, because time is so special. So when you right. lose all that time and that huge investment and then it's kind of like, who are you? Yeah. It's so infuriating. So yeah. yeah, very uh, yeah, marital hate. I think is it's underrated. <laughs> <laughs> Way well, underrated. That's why that's why they call it crime of passion. Right, right. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. There's no other crime like that. That's right. I don't. I don't think the, the crime of passion excuse doesn't fly in the states like it does in France, though, right? No, it doesn't. No. It's like, totally different. Yeah, because in France, like you can, if you do, you know this about mm -mm. so. 
if you walk in and like you know your partner is in bed with another person you can literally like pull a gun out shoot them both and you'll get away with it because mm -hmm. in france it you know crime of passion you're temporarily insane right and so they're like you know i think you, they probably send you an asylum but like you don't do like double life sentences or anything like that mm. which you are temporarily insane. yeah yeah totally yeah yeah, yeah. That, it's interesting that, that's interesting it's like culturally too it makes sense like from all their films mm -hmm. and their culture that 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 would be totally well, we would do, but yet we were talking about it the other day how french men are always perceived of having uh, a Side mistress mm -hmm. and it's quite acceptable and people just don't mm -hmm. it, it's not like oh they did you know it's yeah. just a part of their culture it seems right why Cut to, you're going to see an abundance of American men just moving to France right now. Like, <laughs> Great <laughs> exodus. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it that when a woman commits a crime, like any of the ones we've spoken about today, it stings more than if a man did it? I guess my my take on it is, you know, a, a woman represents, you know, traditionally a nurturer, a nurturing, mm -hmm. caring, love, you know, like homemaker. Like these are all kind of tropes that society is kind of, you know, that that's kind of at the forefront of the the perception. And so I think when all of a sudden they're killing children, mutilating, you know, husbands and murdering, you know, it's just like whoa. We just don't expect it from women. No. Yeah. But it, then it's why that's why it's, it's so fascinating too when women do. It, I find it fascinating, it and is. I want to know what led up to all of the decision that they made that landed them in jail. Like, mm -hmm. what what was going on? Did they feel trapped? Was there psychological abuse? Is it is it um, in fact them that is the problem or you know it's there there are so many questions about mm -hmm. because it's just so much harder to fathom a woman doing this I, yeah. I honestly i honestly think a lot of it has to do with how complicated divorce is mm -hmm. because people start people feel i'm guessing you know just from my own experience i felt incredibly overwhelmed going through a divorce you're like i don't understand i feel like there's a mountain sat on my shoulders and i it you know i wonder is is the thought process well if I just kill them, they're gone. I don't have to worry about any of that. And I still get to have the ha the life I have and the house I have. And I don't have to slice everything in half. I think it's the, you know, the, I, I'm wondering if the institution of marriage is a driving force to it because of the, how complicated it is to unwind. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, even like Brad, Brad Pitt now. How long has that divorce been going on? Hey, he fucked up that winery, okay? If he didn't <laughs> fuck up that winery, we would be done. <laughs> oh, no. But I mean, divorces go on and, and on yeah. and on. Yeah. And if you're in a position where you don't have much mm -hmm. to give, mm -hmm. it must be like, can you imagine what it would do to you mentally? Yeah. Just so it gets so ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you think oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna lose my house. Mm -hmm. How am I gonna live? And mm -hmm. oh, there's not gonna be you know with child support. I'm not gonna have enough to kind of you know it's mm -hmm. you know all these things. I think contribute. Yeah. And then you throw in trauma, mental illness, and like it just compounds, and then they snap. Mm -hmm. Like I wonder how many of them are like sociopathic. I'm sure there's. I think there has probably to be Lori Vallow was. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's... she is a sociopath. That there is something about that, you know. Um, Lorena Bobbitt, I don't think. No, is. I don't think is. But then I, the last one, I, I think she's a sociopath. Yeah, I do be. too. Yeah, just no empathy. They just didn't. To like, if I hurt somebody and didn't fess up to it in any way, mm -hmm. I couldn't live with myself. It would take yeah, me out. It would be horrible. There's just no way. Well, I think there's context. Like if someone, you know, if I always say, like if someone, like you know fucked with my kids and assaulted them or whatever i'd have no problem hurting them and... all right what do you what do you think about people that that get into accidents like knock other people down in the road and just keep going hit and runs is oh, that's horrible it's it's i could never what that's kind horrible. of person yeah are you to do that that's, but that's, that's what that's fear horrible. does to people yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's fight or flight yeah that's an action as much as it's a horrible thing to do and I personally would never do it it is a natural human response because like what Jack just said is fight or flight you either stay or you run and it's what your 
your mind will tell you to do. So I understand it in that sense, but not then going into the police department and turning yourself in immediately. A, a lot of times to that point, a lot of times people will run from it because they've been drinking mm -hmm. and they know it's so much worse to have hit and, you know, you, you hit someone when you're drunk, you're fucked. Mm -hmm. So they'll sober up and then go it's turn themselves in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it can, they can even, it's actually depending on how many DUIs you have, it could even just be murder. Yeah. Like it just goes, yeah. So it's, um, I do know that that is a, a factor in a lot of them. Yeah. There's been so many hit and runs in LA recently. Mm -hmm. Like a lot. That poor boy who lost his leg and... <sighs> Did you see that fucking, the woman at the moving escalator floor at yes. the Bangkok? Yes. Oh, yeah, that was yes. horrible. What happened? No, that was, horrible. That was oh. hideous. Hideous. Yeah. This Thai woman in the Bangkok airport was like on one of the moving conveyor belts to like, you mm -hmm. know, instead of walking through the long hallways. And it broke and her foot, her leg went in and just chopped her leg off at the horrible. knee. I don't want to see that. Horrible. And she's, you, I mean... You just see her, just but she's very in control. I think it was shock. shock she was just yeah. kind of wide-eyed, looking around, like, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <sighs> oh God, I know, I <laughs> saw that. Yeah, no, no. Speaking of escalators, one of the things that you shouldn't let your children on if they are wearing Crocs is an escalator. Mm. You should see the videos of what happens it because the um, the the bit just as you're getting to the top. <laughs> It cuts sucks. it off. It, there's something on it that with the the material no. that the shoes, the rubber that it's made from, it just sucks the rubber into it. Oh. Ooh. And it like, I, I was like, I am never, I saw it on Instagram. I'm like, I'm never letting my kid go on an escalator with Crocs. But no. would, you, would you let your son wear Crocs? No. Yes, <laughs> I wear Crocs. They're so <laughs> offensive and ugly. I love them. I like the Balenciaga ones. Oh, you do? I like, that, I yeah. like the, the platform ones. Uh, so weird. I have a weird story about that. So when I was when I was single, I like matched with this girl on a dating app. And she did like the really weird late night response being like, let's go get dinner. But it was like 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, where are we going to? Do? It's 11 o'clock at night. And so we met at some restaurant in Hollywood. And, and she said, oh, you know, she's from New York and worked in finance or whatever. And I was like, whatever. Okay, so she walks in and she's wearing like a she was wearing like normal clothes but with like a silk robe over it and the platform balenciaga <laughs> crocs with a bunch of charms on mm -hmm. and she was russian and i was like oh this feels like a bit of a catfish mm, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then she proceeds to tell me that the finance that she was involved in she was a professional gambler so that counts oh, as finance yeah and that she was <laughs> Um, she was uh, amassing a wealth to donate it all to create artificial wombs so women no longer have to carry babies. And that at the point when women no longer have to carry babies, that's the time when only men and women can truly be equal. And I'm just sat there like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, <laughs> okay, I mean, maybe equal in the workforce. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, what what is it? You know, I was like trying to like poke holes in it without angering her because mm -hmm. she was one of these very intense Russian women. Mm -hmm. And um, then I was like, all right, well, it's pretty late now. I guess I guess I'm going to go home and just like bail. She goes, money. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, she's like, do you want to play a game of poker? <laughs> but terrifying. And That sounds really scary. Yeah. Yeah, so beware of Russians and Crocs. I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll noted. Do you? Here's a here's a question to end. Does anyone think they've ever actually met a murderer? Yes, I have. Really? Yeah. All right, everyone, cough up the stories. I can't. You can't? Because I believe this person is a future murderer. Mm. Oh. I don't believe potential. Uh, okay. It's a potential like, yes. tendencies. Okay. I I believe the person is. Uh, but I've also met. People who have murdered people. People who've like done it and then got out or people who are like, whoa. Mm. <laughs> Margaret's like. Hmm. Both. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. Both. Margaret, you? I uh, went on a date with and uh, really liked, but then he didn't like me back in the 90s. It was a, one of the writers for my television show in 1994. And he ended up murdering the mother of his baby 
and leaving her in the closet for a month until she had partially mummified. <gasps> and then um, and left the baby alone for three days while he walked down miles and miles away, kind of not sure what to do. I think the worst part of it, they left the baby alone oh. yeah. for three days, which is like, oh of course, my God. horrible that you killed the mother. That's just, but the, to top it off, yeah, like abandoned a child, a toddler, like not even a toddler, like a newborn. But um, how did the baby survive? It just cried, but it survived. Oh the resilience God. Yeah. of a child. It's really incredible. But um, yeah, so he went to prison and um, I actually wrote a song about it. And then um, he was trying to email me through another person saying, he, I want you to tell, well, I want you to hear my side of the story. I don't need to hear his side. No. no. There no. is no There's side. There's no, I don't want to hear that side. Is he still in prison? He's out. Whoa. <gasps> Watch so, out. I know. That what song about... better enough. Be, that, that better be a good song. <laughs> it's a good song. <laughs> what about the guy recently who I had, okay, so one of my friends lived in a building with the guy who, where the guy murdered his girlfriend and drained her blood. Oh, it, I'm very, I'm intimately connected to that story. Same. Mm. Yes. So it, Must be the same friend. No, well, this guy was the, he was the comic book writer in West Hollywood. Oh, right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And I lived walking distance from there. Wow. And I remember when that all went down and my... My friends were friends with him. Well, you know what happened with me in that, right? So um, a, a person I worked with was very, that was his best friend. They both moved here from Canada together and they grew up together, everything. So this friend of mine, when the murder happened, he became, he, he kind of went into like a psychotic episode and he was really, really struggling, like kind of lost his marbles. And I would get these crazy fucking emails from him. And he'd be like, you know, the Clintons are involved in this and that. And and then I get a and he's like, I need uh, he somehow he was friends with another friend of mine who was uh, in the military. And I get a call from my friend in the military being like, what, is this guy fucking with me? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes. I got an email saying I'm surrounded by the police and and send help and da 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 da. And I happened to have had I was in Hollywood because I'd got I had friends in town and we'd gone to dinner. And I was like, let me go let me go past his house to see what the hell's going on because this email was like I'm surrounded by cops. I pull up to the the street that my friend lived on. There is two police helicopters spotlight up my friend's house. There's SWAT team have the per place perimetered off this whole thing. And he was in a standoff with the police oh. because they, I think, somehow thought that maybe there was a connection with him and the murder mm. and he might have been involved. And because he'd kind of he was sending these crazy, like, you know, very, you know, meant, you know, unstable emails to people. Manic. And I was sat there for three hours with the negotiators for the SWAT team negotiating him to come out the door because he would only speak to me on the phone. Mm. He comes out. How did I wait, wait? Pause. You were dealing with the police in yeah, because I turned up and I'm like, "Are you here for so and so?" And they went, "Get out of here! You need to get out of here. This is a, this is a dangerous thing or whatever." And I'm like, "No, I just spoke to him on the phone." And like a sergeant overheard me saying that and went, "Wait, you just spoke to him?" I'm like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Get over here!" And like for like three hours, we like, and so he he comes out. He's he believed. In his in his state that he was in that he was undercover for the FBI and the only way that he would go seek help is if the FBI pulled him out. So a f his other friends contacted the L.A. FBI offices and were like, listen, a friend is having a psychotic break breakdown. Will you just have some FBI agent say, hey, we're pulling you out? And after like 24 hours, the FBI were like, OK, we can do that. And an FBI agent came down from the federal building, went up to him and was like, hey, we're pulling you out. And he goes, OK, and then checked himself into a mental health facility. Is he still there? No. He's out? No. Yeah. 
Yeah, what no, was this he was years on? ago. What was he on? Not on anything. He just he, he was so he had a mental breakdown. So distraught by what his friend had done. Yeah. And he kept going to the the court hearings for the trial, and it was like this whole fucking yeah. thing. Yeah, that's intense. Yeah, yeah. Someone, uh, I I don't know if I can probably say this, but someone that we all know very close with, um, knew Ted Bundy, and also knew um, uh, his name was. Uh, I forget his name is Bob something. He had the bazaar in Kansas where the clown Bob Rodella? Yes, knew him. Yeah, wow. And uh, his office was above the bazaar, and he collected oddities. And so he used mm-hmm. to go in there, mm-hmm. oddity shopping. Mm-hmm. And this guy would he would murder. He was in some in some regards he was worse than like Dahmer. Yeah, Bob Rodella is a lot like Bo- Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He would like take these young boys. He would like you know assault them, videotape it, chop and them eat up, them. eat them. He would, and then he would sell their body parts in his oddity shop. Yeah, I wonder how many serial killers we've actually met and not known because yeah, there's so there many. are so there's many, so many. Of them. There's so we never know. We won't know. We won't know until later. Yeah. But it, but it, listen. That that's obviously terrifying. But then there are people that we all know that put on a face of being really something totally different than mm-hmm. they are yeah whereas people are so friendly and so whatever social and the whole thing and then really they are just terrible people yeah yeah we could talk about this for hours and hours why do women like crime so much i think uh, reading about it because oftentimes we're the victims so reading about it gives us a sense of control over something like that ha- possibly happening it's true i always am like well but what why kind of do alleyway? why do women write to murderers and then marry them oh yeah that's a whole different thing i don't that, yeah. that's a mental thing yeah do you know who vincent gallo's new girlfriend is no charles manson's wife the woman that he married when he was in prison oh the oh, one that was going to sell his corpse yes. to um zach bagan's a museum. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she gets. She, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a whole other thing of where women are attracted to murderers yeah, and want to marry them. Yeah, because they think that they can change them and it will never happen to me. Yeah, and it's also like love with love of danger. It's I think it's called hybristophilia, where women fall in love with murderers or like want to be around um, people who are dangerous, bad boys. Kelly's got a bit of that. She likes bad boys. Bad boys. I was like, <laughs> I literally like, was Ugh. like, I kind of relate, but I don't think that I would. I don't get the point of of going after somebody who you couldn't even touch, right? Maybe that's a part of it. Forbidden fruit. Mm-hmm. But don't they in some prisons allow you conjugal visits? Yeah, yeah. Um, some. I don't know if Manson was allowed him. He was think he was too maximum security. He was in like he was in Folsom, right? Here in California, he yeah. was somewhere. I don't remember the name of the prison. Damn, Margaret, you where's your crime podcast? I know. I just read a lot about it. I love it. Yes, I know everything. <laughs> do you uh, do you ever listen to Sword and Scale? Yeah, that's a good one. That's yeah, that's my that's favorite. That's very, very well researched. Yeah. Lots of detail. Yeah. That's what I love about it when it's really, really well detailed. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. And I like how they always change how they tell the story. Mm-hmm. It's it's really yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. Well, Margaret. I think this is. We have to wrap this up. Thank I could you. talk about this for hours. I know. I know. Well, I love you all. Thank you so oh, much for love having you, me. Margaret. I have thank some, you for some being bad news with us. For you, though, I feel like your dog and I have a connection. You guys really were like eye contact, deep eye mm-hmm. contact this whole and time. And all these kisses, and I'm like, mm, so many kisses. Like maybe he might want to. Well, she, sorry, might want to come over to mine. Yeah, she loves you. How old Four. is she? Oh, just a bubba. She's a baby. She's in her prime. She's in her prime. She's so gorgeous. She's gorgeous. All right. Uh, where can people find you? Margaret? You can find me on um, online, margaretcho.com, um, at Margaret Cho on Twitter, Margaret underscore Cho on Instagram, and the Margaret Cho on TikTok. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, and you're touring right now? I'm on tour. Uh, people can find out everything. I'm everywhere, um, but people can see it on margaretcho.com. All right. Cool. And uh, if people are watching on YouTube, make sure you click like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, cool. We will see you next week. Later.